questions. I have some thoughts, but I definitely want a nice flowing discussion here. And everyone gets a chance that wants to talk. So uh, Michael Shore, um, were you familiar with his previous work? Had you watched The Good Place? Uh, because I feel like that show really um, distilled so much of what is in this book. And, and he, he's been obviously interested in these topics for a while now and has been working on it. And if you were um, like me listening to the audio of it, you heard the entire cast of The Good Place um, read different sections of this book, which I found to be quite entertaining. And I like kind of seeing who he decided to do for which part. Uh, so that was great. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of his work. I think that, um, you know, he also did Parks and Rec, Parks and Recreation, another show that had similar themes. Um, you know, he he came up under um, Greg Daniels on The American Office. And I just think that the style of comedy that those guys have done with um, to kind of, I think, reinvigorating and making what used to be sort of a you know, maybe a tired format for a while, but the American sitcom has really come back strong, um, especially it's stuff that those guys were doing with um, over at NBC. So anyway, I, I'm big fan of his a big fan of his writing. I think he's funny. I think he's uh, he's got something to say. He's really um, heartfelt and emotional also. Um, so, yeah. So uh, when I normally talk about the author, I'm, you know, mentioning other books and stuff they've written, but it's interesting with with Michael Shore. It's it's you know, go to go to streaming and watch his shows if you want to see what he's been doing before this. Um, it's it's those shows that I mentioned. So that's a bit about him. Um, Harvard man and uh, yeah, late 40s and uh, family guy. Um, anyway, um, I posted a really fun video of him talking to his um, former co-worker and friend Nick Offerman, who you might remember from Parks and Rec. Uh, and they are talking about the themes of this book and about the book. And it's a it's a fun video. If you get our newsletter, if you click on um, the image of um, from the book, it'll it'll take you to um, to that to that video. And I'll, I think I put it on uh, our Facebook also. So welcome. Um, who wants to kick it off tonight? Anyone want to have a resolution they want to share or what they thought of the book uh, to get it going? I have a couple uh, other icebreaker questions that I put in the chat that I will uh, replay for you guys uh, here. But I'd love to see uh, a hand. I see Rebecca's hand is up. So Rebecca, may I unmute you? Please talk to us. Um, happy 2023 to you as well. Um, and I don't think uh, you can, I think you can say it as long as you want, you know. Okay. <laughs> and I do really hope 2023 is a good one. I think we've had slight improvements from 2020. Um, so 2021 was a little better in 2022. I'm, I'm not yeah. saying that they were the best years, but so I have high hope for 2023. Yeah. Um, my resolution as such, and I've heard this on a lot of people from a lot of people in various versions is do less. Yeah. Okay. I think I think we've um, I, I guess been pressured up until a certain point to continually do more, and I think mm -hmm. that has led to a lot of the existential. Uh, can I use that word now? Um, yeah. On we that um, we maybe all have had had uh, suffered through it to some extent, um, one way or the other, and uh, some people that I really, I don't know, respect, have just said, well, just don't try to do everything, you know, yeah. um, and, you know, don't try to be perfect. Ha ha. Um, <laughs> uh, my initial reactions to this book were, one, you you can really hear Michael Schur's voice. I mean, because he also was an um, influential in Saturday Night Live in the Waking Weekend Update. Uh, 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 that was one of his earliest writing gigs, I guess. And so I, I, I can hear his voice so much in, like you said, modern comedy, uh, modern shows. Um, I wonder if that will date him, but you, that's the risk of any author using any kind of um, current type of uh, uh, language, I guess. Um, I I really enjoyed the book. I listened to audiobook. I think that was your recommendation because we could hear so many of the voices of the actors. And I was a huge fan of The Big Place, of uh, The Good Place, uh, just a huge fan. I just, um, I liked it. I didn't know that I was kind of a philosophy nerd until I realized that I was familiar, familiar with many of these um, of, uh, philosophers that he talked about. Um, so many of our, our white men from the Western world, I mean, he did include um, a, a few exceptions to that, but, um, and I, 
I wonder whether it is a place of white male privilege to try to come up with the rules for how we behave. Um, mm. I, I, I think of philosophy as trying to determine the best way to be. And, um, you know, in other words, if you are doing this, you're doing it wrong. If you're doing this, you're doing it right. And, and I, I, I just wonder whether that's the, a domain of those who ha don't have many other things to worry about. Um, and he goes into that into an extent, yes. not about the writing philosophy, but how he is the privileged amongst the privileged. And and I I I, I did um, appreciate that perspective. Um, I do um, think that his leaving out religion and the discussion of the um, philosophies of religion kind of was a bit of a gap. I think he did it deliberately because then it gets into a whole other level of thing. But I believe religion is also um, a type of philosophy to try to describe how to be good. You know, um, they often ascribe it to, you know, following a God or, or you know, wh whomever it is. Um, but the uh, end result is to try to be perfect or as good as possible. Um, and I realized by the end of it that... Um, after going through it, and I really loved how he really emphasized um, all of the lessons that we learned over the course of the time, and he really brought them up again. I felt like if I'd taken a test on this, I probably would have passed. Um, Good, because there is one at the end of this. Okay, all right, all right. Um, um, I've actually made my sketch note a page, and it has an A plus in the corner, as if we were going to be taking a test. So uh, awesome. I had that in my mind. Um, but I've, I kind of have two philosophical things that I live by. Um, one is uh, the golden rule, which does come mm -hmm. out of religion, and mm -hmm. unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I've heard an, uh, uh, a, a, um, a modification of that, do unto others as they would have them done unto themselves. Because... If we assume that what we want is what all want, then we mm. can make uh, yeah. some pretty bad choices. Instead, we need to be thinking about what they would actually want and treat them that way. Um, and I, I did appreciate that. Um, and the second one is homegrown, just in my own. And I didn't really come to it until I was, I don't know, in my 40s. Um, and it it was, I call I, I think of it as the final step of growing up when I realized that life is not fair. It is just not fair. There is nothing that is going to um, set it all right at some point so that everyone gets an equal shot at everything. There are, it, it's not. Life is also hard. And I think it's designed that way. Whether or not you believe in a greater power or um, you know, a humanist or whatever, but so it's unfair and it's hard. And there's going to be pain, there's going to be loss, there's going to be all sorts of things that you cannot avoid. So once you accept that, once you see that that is the, the way the, you know, it's all set up, your job is to be as happy as possible. And happiness is uh, something that mm, I also kind of went through a, a is happiness a, 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 a light-hearted type of thing? Is it, it's not the same as pleasure. It's not the same as fun. Happiness is actually something that comes when we are fulfilled and we're doing the right things, hopefully for other people as well as for ourselves. So the pursuit of happiness is written into our um, Declaration of Independence. And I think it is actually um, written in, in um, Aristotle's um, uh, uh, thing. So happiness is something that, we have to strive for, which means we cannot give into the pain, the uh, unhappiness, the sorrow, the unfairness. Um, that's just going to be there. And so our job is to overcome that and be as happy as possible. So those are my two philosophies. Treat other people well, however you, you choose to interpret that, and then um, try to be as happy as possible. And, um, you know, good luck with all that. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so great. So that what a great kickoff. So many, so many great points, Rebecca, and so many things that uh, I connect with also uh, and definitely feel. Um, let me, I took some notes. Let me, let me go through this. So the thing about, yeah, religion not being mentioned, I think uh, it was definitely intentional. I feel like that would create a whole other book 
And I feel like it is touched on lightly um, in the good place also. And um, if I can extrapolate his take on it from there, it's it's kind of like um, there are a lot of commonalities, and you know there there is a lot of overlap in in major world religions. And um, when we do look at things like the Golden Rule, um, you know that's a perfect example of it. Um, but yeah, that it was it wasn't. Um, addressed as, and I think he was, he was really looking at uh, from a philosophy standpoint and not so much wanting to, wanting to get into different religions and, and parsing that out. Um, I love, I love your, uh, golden rule. Life is not fair. It's hard. Be as happy as possible. Uh, uh, my, uh, holiday card, uh, came, there's two phrases that we hear a lot in this house. One, my wife says, one, I say, she says, be kind. I say, have fun. We combine those two. I think if you can be kind and have fun, and it, maybe that's not the same as being as happy as possible, but I do feel like this um, this happiness um, principle, this quotient, is is brought up in this book. Uh, it, you know, it's one of the it's one of the um, I forget which philosopher it was now who is you know sometimes though when you're just out for yourself and making yourself happy, then you end up like um, Ayn Rand, right? And that that's sort of a, a philosophy, but um, but I do think that there's something to that about. Um, life is not fair. And also he talks about that with, if you are gifted um, with um, wealth, you know, you uh, might have a responsibility to do more, you know, uh, and, and that might not seem fair, but, you know, then the people that don't have that much might not think it's fair that, that you have all the money and they don't. So I do think that he, he touches on that in this, in, in this too, about how uh, he himself puts it on himself. It's like, a uh, perfect example is the situation with the car, uh, how he, uh, you know, that really sparked this whole thing where he was getting on this guy about, you know, what was a minor, what he deemed to be a minor damage to this guy's car. But, uh, and this goes a little bit to your uh, do unto others as you would have done unto you. He, he's talked about this in other interviews that I don't remember if he went this deep into it in the book, but he found, you know, he found out from the guy later that like, you know, his kids had left the house. They're like the only thing that he really cared about was actually having a nice car. Like this guy, like it meant a lot to him to just have this car. And so then he felt really bad because he was judging like how much this guy cared apparently about, you know, this, this fender bender kind of thing. And, uh, and then he felt bad, you know, he didn't understand what it meant to that person. And, and so they talk about how, like when you get stuck in traffic and you're blaming someone for, you know, driving a certain way or cutting you off. And if you just imagine that they are going to, you know, help someone else or who knows what they have going on. But if you put sort of the best construction on something, that's, that's also sort of like a, a biblical thing, but this idea of, um, yeah, if you assume, you know, good intent, uh, for others, um, before you immediately go to the negative that can help too. But, um, I don't know. I just kind of went off on a bunch of stuff there, but you gave it, you gave me a lot to, a lot to chew on. Um, so much good stuff. Who else? Um, one, one, one quick coda to what you said about the car thing. And, and I've decided why we are all so angry when we're driving cars. And I speak as yeah. someone who has deliberately given up a car. I am four okay. months now without having a car. Wow. The reason why we are so angry and is because we're scared and because mm -hmm. driving a car in a, is inherently a, or being, in, you know, and so we have to be on edge all the time just to do this thing right. And that's mm -hmm. why it takes very little from other people to make mm -hmm. us very angry because they are putting our lives at risk. That's just my thought. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've been in a car driven by a teenager, so I have felt that my life is at risk. Um, I totally understand that. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, no, I, there's, I get, I get upset in traffic. I get, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Uh, anyone else want to uh, say something or look at some of the questions I put in the chat? If you don't know what to say, you could tell us your new year's resolution or, you know, what did you think of the book? Maybe if you're rating it on something like Goodreads, what would you give it and why? Anything. Feel free. Hey, Pete, talk to us. Hey. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed the book and it's, 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 Pretty funny. Rebecca brought up something that uh, Carolyn um, uh, said to me when she was reading it. So then, oh, you'll love this. It's all white man stuff. Thinking about how we should all live. And uh, uh, but uh, I read a uh, I read a lot of this in college. I think every 
book they brought up I had read at some point and I, I really enjoyed the ripping of Ayn Rand. That was just funny. Because, uh, you know, it's like I've, I've had talks with objectivist people forever, but um, and it, it's just like, oh, you're just going through a phase. If you're a decent person, you'll 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 get out of it. Um, <laughs> and then and this book is kind of, a, you know, it's a lot of ways to say it. Like, you know, just don't be a dick, basically, is the, you know, try to be try to be better. But you don't have to be yeah. uh, you don't. You don't have to give everything away. You just have to try to do better with what you got. Now you raised a good question, which I think with all of this comes up uh, these days is the, um, like, uh, uh, like can, uh, can, does anyone get forgiven anymore in cancel culture yes. stuff? Thank you. So I, I put this, uh, it's one of the things I'm so, uh, I feel like we're in, we're in something right now. And, and I would love if anyone can think of an example. Uh, we've seen a lot of people get canceled. Um, and he talks about this, about if, what, if you can, if we can like art made by bad people if you can still appreciate that or not. And then he talks about the different levels of that and how you have to decide for yourself, basically, uh, along this, you know, this line of things. And I, I don't, I, I want to, I'll let you keep going, Pete, but I, I'm so glad that you're, you're touching on this because, um, and I also, along with this, I want you to think about, um, has the, reading this changed your behavior at all yet? Because I was at Costco and I made sure to walk my cart back and put that, <laughs> I was like, I thought it was so funny. I, I looked and I was like, of course I'm returning this card. <laughs> I'm like, it would be really bad if anyone saw me not return the card right now while I'm reading this book. No, but uh, no, I was like, it wasn't even, I was like, but it made me think about it. And I feel like it, this is the kind of um, book that you could come back to and it might at least, I don't know if it's gonna completely change who you are, but I think that it might make you think about things. And, and like you said, at its core, it's it's be a be a nicer person. Try harder. Basically, he talks about how you're gonna fail. You know, you're gonna make mistakes, and you're gonna in uh, along along those lines. It might come back to you. Might still like the example he gives is like a Woody Allen movie or something like that. Even when you know this, and you sh and you know you have to justify that. But can anyone think of in all you know in the last few years? Someone that has given, and I love when he talked about this, apologies and, and what's a good apology and what's a, what's a bad apology and how we, we see these so often now. And has anyone given a good apology and then been like accepted back it, into, um, not well, that they're uncanceled, but like, so, so Pete, go ahead, continue with what you were saying, but I, I feel like. Yeah, and in that vein, oh, no, no, it was, I was, yeah. I was looking up, I was. You know, there's so many examples you can pick from, but I, I chose to look at Louis C.K. and I was, yes. I just googled like, did he ever apologize? And then I was looking back at it, like in 2017, he was doing a full-on apology tour. I mean, I think he was, I think he contacted all the, all the people that were in the room and what it, what he was doing. And, um, but the, I guess the question is whether it works or not. Is like. Um, I guess the victim uh, club expanded because it's like, well, suddenly, well, Louis, you're a public figure. So now you've got a bigger problem because now you have to deal with all the people, not just that you directly offended, but all the people like you who've been behaving that way. So I think you got a bigger apology thing. Now, it's interesting that I noticed like I hadn't paid much attention to him because I thought he was pretty funny. I liked his show, but I never, I liked his act, but I never thought hard about him beyond that. Uh, but his, he uncanceled himself and he's got his own show. It's almost like a sub stack or something, but he's got a, his webpage. He's got some millions of followers that pay him 25 bucks for, um, you know, you pay something to see his stuff. You're and, still talking about. Are you still talking about Louis? Louis, yeah, yeah. And and so it's interesting too. It's like, well, um, you know, that's that to me is like, all right, we're not we're not getting any better. So in that case, um, I think there's there's 
there's there's something that could be done on his part, but I don't I don't really follow him that much. But I think it's a situation that Lou and then Woody Allen's just too far gone, you know. I mean, I don't know. There's just like yeah. Um, I saw that special, and I'm pretty convinced by Dylan's account that that poor girl just went through hell at at his hands, and he's not really. Um, owned up to what he's done to others and then like you like in the pointed out in the book when you go into all his behavior um you know the that movie i forget whether it was manhattan or annie hall was right. it manhattan? oh it's manhattan yeah yeah with, yeah yeah but that one's just yeah. sick and then and that and that he approached her later like when she was like old like 17 or something it was like that that was just so sick and it's kind of like where um, that's a guy with a lot of problems. So, but you know, you sep separate out. If you enjoyed Woody Allen movies, you're not evil. I mean, if you laughed at it, that that's fine. Uh, but now that if you know, you have to Paul Wellstone it. Know better, do better. And then um, I think it's where we um, we we get better by just recognizing that a lot of this stuff isn't okay. And like he pointed out, if you got it on CD, if it was an, insp if Sleeper was an inspirational movie that moved you into comedy or you've done great things as a result, well, fine, congratulations. But yeah, it, it's still not, it doesn't have to uh, lie around and remind like, and, and it's not just like the same thing like Louis C.K. It's not just Dylan, what that poor girl went through. It's all girls that go through that, and yeah, and the and the perpetrators that are not held to account, and that's what so that's what we have to do. That's our Overton window to open up and get better. And <laughs> that, we're, that part made me laugh out loud when it is like the guy's name was John Overton Window. <laughs> that was his actual <laughs> name. <laughs> a couple yes. times I just laughed out loud at like the delivery was just so great. <laughs> it's like Overton Window <laughs> was his name. Uh, Okay, yeah. Uh, it reminds you also, I, I think it in terms then of if, if someone isn't around to apologize. Like, I know there's some people who won't play Michael Jackson anymore, but there's others who, like, I have played Jackson 5 stuff, and when people have looked at me like, I can't believe you're playing this, I said, look, uh, this was when he was being abused, not when, when he was maybe abusing someone. I mean, that's not a great thing to say or respond, but I'm like, yeah, I love some of the early Jackson five stuff. I don't want to delete everything from my playlist. Uh, but you know, it, that's tough. I mean, I, I still hear, you know, I still hear his stuff in, and, but I don't know if it's because that's one of those, that's like, if you don't believe, you know, um, the, the, the accusers, because you know, whatever, ver same thing, kind of like with the way Woody Allen one, you can take a side there. I, I don't know. I mean, but there's other people who have been like, maybe more definitively like i mean like a harvey weinstein got it everyone agrees that person yeah. you know was canceled yeah and jeffrey so, epstein i mean those guys yeah. are, you know there's just they're just over yeah. bad, whereas bad it's people. like maybe some people who there's you know there's a maybe a majority of people that think they are but others are like well it's whatever so it's a whole thing that's an, I mean, it, it was it was a small part of this book, but he teased it. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, he's really going there. He's really talking about how influential, um, you know, it, it's it's like sometimes they say you never want to meet your heroes. But it's almost like he got so inspired by someone that then turned out to be, you know, someone that he thinks is, you know, a despicable, you know, um, you know, a person that you should not support um and it devotes you know a whole chapter about to it. got a lot of yeah. hands now i'm excited and to i gotta them. mute myself i'm losing yeah. points i'll never get in the good place now <laughs> oh oh mark good to see you again talk to us mark uh yeah so um uh lisa my wife was sitting on the couch the other day and she groaned audibly and it was because she found out the cosby is going to try to do a comeback tour um, so there is that Showtime documentary about Cosby that's worth watching. It's like a four part, uh, maybe four or six part series. Uh, w. Kamau Bell doing his assessment of his own relationship with Cosby. That wasn't what I raised my hand for, but that's okay. a, a mention there. Um, so uh, I ba I'm backloading my New Year's resolution because we got solar panels this last year. 
uh, and I do post from time to time on having the solar panels. I've and seen that. In light of this uh, book, uh, it kind of dovetailed with some of his challenges with the electric vehicle and you think you're doing the right thing and you're not sure if you're doing yeah. the right thing. We're not going to make back our money on the solar panels. One, we might eventually lose the house within the 10 years that would we need to pay back the solar panels. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, people are telling me, well, the materials that go into the solar panels are just as wasteful. So I'm learning a lot of Michael Shore's back end stuff that he was learning about electric vehicles, et cetera. Um, and we don't get any money back on the solar panels. All of the excess energy that we produce because we don't do any on-site storage goes to the community. So we feel good about that. People in need that have energy needs are going to get that excess back from our solar production if we go over 100%. Um, and we're only make like we were very low energy users in the first place. So our bills were only like $50 a month, but we were we felt like we were doing it for the bigger cause, yeah. regardless of the financial incentive that we'd be getting back. So virtue signaling there, you know, all these things come into play when it comes to all of this stuff. Yeah. And this is all against the bigger backdrop of me as a white male reading this book with a lot of Michael Shore's kind of commonalities in terms of him being a dutiful person growing up, a rule follower, um, and also recognizing his privilege, which I've I've been on that journey as well, especially for the last 10 years. But always in the back of my mind, I've always felt like, what happiness am I entitled to when he gets to that time and a place argument? Because, you know, white men have been in this position of having advantages for a long time. So I think I sometimes sabotage my own self in terms of not going for some things, because I'm having a hard time teasing out what I'm entitled to, like what, you know, this whole idea of the overall happiness of everyone versus individual happiness. So it was a very compelling read for me against the backdrop of all of that as I'm, you know, making my way through it. So. Thanks for sharing, Mark. I, I do think it's it's one of the things he talks about where it's unfortunately there's work involved and it's not the easiest thing. And, and you try to do something right, but uh, you know it it takes a lot of research and work to figure out exactly if it is the right thing to do. Um, and and that's part of you know um, if if we're in a position to be able to be concerned about those things. It reminds me of like, you know, the hierarchy of needs. I mean, if, if, if we have the luxury of being able to worry about these things versus maybe someone who is just worried about where their next meal is coming from or where they're going to sleep, you know, um, we, we do have to put in that extra work is I think a little bit of what he's trying to say here. And, um, I hope that you're not, uh, but that you also did take away that, um, the parts where he talks about, you don't want to be a completely, um, you know, boring person who doesn't feed back to their soul anything. And I know how much, you know, certain things um, that you feed off of um, would give you fuel and passion. And it's like, you have to feed your own soul, right? You have to be a complete person, kind of what we're talking about, about being, being happy. Um, so don't deny yourself those things. You said something I was afraid of. You said you might lose your house in 10, within 10 years. <laughs> no, if we were to sell our house, we just, okay. we pay, you're not going to lose it though. You're not, you're not no. on the verge of losing your house. We're not going to start a GoFundMe right now for Mark. No, uh, but we're, we'd, no. Be, we'd be, we'd be, we'd be gifting those solar panels, whoever comes next, because they're sure. not paying any kind of outstanding balance on them. We paid for it up. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I think it's while we shall take a look right now. Um, it's unfortunate. We're talking a lot about like uh, white males. Um, we've never had this many more white males than females <laughs> in the books and bars window right now. Look at all the dudes showing up for this book. All the dudes are like, can I be happy? Is it cool? <laughs> like, <laughs> is it okay? <laughs> All the white guys are laughing right now. Am I right? All right. Let's hear from a lady. Hey, Susan, talk to us. <laughs> oh, um, well, my New Year's, I don't usually do resolutions, but um, I decided to study more. And this year I'm going to study up on classical music. I don't know a lot awesome. about it. I'm intrigued. And I, I read The Violin Conspiracy, which is, cool. I think, on our short list. Yeah. And I would highly recommend it. Yeah, I hear and, great things. Um got me very intrigued about classical music. So awesome. That's, that's where I'm headed. Um 
And uh, Rebecca, um, I was raised also by a woman who kept telling me life isn't fair. Get over it, life isn't fair. And, um, and I had to chuckle about the on Rand because I ended up reading two of her books. I went through that phase. It was short-lived, but I went through that phase. And she was a very bad writer. So um, I don't know. There were a lot of things that tickled me. I had laughed a lot. Um, and I liked his use of the word flourish. I think it goes mm -hmm. beyond happiness. It's yeah. more about how you you can be a better person and thrive and yes. um, but also you know it, I think it has bigger meaning than just being happy you can be happy and be a bad person but I think if you really want to flourish there's something in you that maybe makes life better for others yeah yep it's like My um, self actualization like you're, yes. you're getting to the point yes where you really are um yes Fully achieving that that's a that's a great point thank you Sue. and i and i put in the chat the three i think that have come back from being canceled as yes l franken or frankenstein as i said auto corrected me um bill mauer who uh -huh. was canceled after 9 11 his show and then came back on hbo and um who's my third kathy griffin is making a comeback all right that's a good list. I think you're probably right about those. Uh, and, you know, I feel like um, some people will never get back to the level that they were at, though. Like, can you? I don't. I don't know if I can picture Al Franken being, uh, you know, elected again. Or really, uh, I don't know. But maybe locally. Maybe, yeah. Statewide. It feels like, yeah. It's interesting. It's it's such a yeah. It's I don't know. I mean remember this now and just think of the next time you see someone come back and who's actually if anyone's forgiven because i'm not saying we shouldn't forgive people because i think that's actually one of the points that the 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 book makes you know is that we're going to make mistakes we're going to fail um and you know i don't know that it's right to forever you know i mean that's certainly not um taught in in most uh religions is you know i mean is you shouldn't hold it against someone forever. You should forgive, right? So I don't know. I, I'm not advocating for any particular canceled person to be forgiven right now. I'm just, it's something that struck me from the book because it's something I've been thinking about with, um, you know, seeing some people's art that I have appreciated and seeing and thought they were really great. And then they're, you know, getting chipped off the list. And Louis C.K. is a perfect example. Woody Allen was another one. Um, I, I, you know, it's tough. It's, it's rough. But I see some more hands and I'm excited that they're not just white men. Donna Adams has her hand up. Let's talk to Donna, please. Uh, so happy new year, everyone. Uh, so many good things, thoughtful things already said. Um, I'm glad Sue mentioned the idea of flourishing because I think after reading this, I thought, no, that's my new year's resolution. I want to make sure that this year I keep awesome. in mind what it means to be to really flourish, not just be happy, but as we've been saying, it's a lot, there are a lot more pieces to that that have to do with being appreciative of what you have and trying to make the world a little bit better place at the same time and looking out for other people and so on. Um, when Rebecca was talking earlier about, you know, the the white males and so on, I think he redeemed himself somewhat with the great section he wrote about recognizing all the luck and privilege in his own life. I mean, when he talked about his own career path, I got a really big kick out of that because it was just one thing after another, yeah. being in the right place at the right time. And then I knew this person. And then because luck. I did that, I did this. And he didn't re I thought he was pretty humble about it. I mean, I, I watched his interview, you know, one of the ones that you sent us, Jeff, and he's a really smart guy, clearly. And knows a lot about how to live his life and, you know, take advantage of all the things around him. So a lot of it is, I'm sure, talent, but he was very clear in that whole, those several pages of how it just moved right through. And he had, you know, really a huge amount of, of privilege as a white male and with means and, and all of that. So I thought that that was good. Um, I also thought that, um, 
the I loved the kind of that when I was a philosophy major in college for a while, so a lot of these people were familiar, but I was really struck by that principle of Ubuntu, or is that the, the South African concept of um, I am because we are, and that whole idea that in any of these, we really have to kind of see ourselves as being advantaged by and a product of and owing to and looking out for everyone around us because there's nobody, no matter what they think they achieve just by their bootstraps or just by working hard or whatever, which tends to be kind of, I think he thinks uniquely American in the sense that we think that's what anyone can do if they just work hard enough. I think he really wants to encourage an idea that we all owe so much to being a fellow human being on this earth. And we owe things to other people because of that. And we need to kind of take other people into account in everything we do. The part that he talked about that I'll, another part he talked about that I thought was really interesting when he is when he talked about the best way to set rules for society would be to do it blindly. I mean, we're, oh, yeah. you know, in an ideal world, you'd, you'd set the rules before you had any idea what role you would be playing in it. You know, and I think about so much of our political world right now, so much of the legislating that's done and so on. People are making these rules, making laws and so on, assuming what their own personal gain can be from it. And not only do they not have this Ubuntu, you know, in mind at all, but they already have an idea of who they and the people they know and who are funding their campaigns or whatever, how they're going to benefit from it. Whereas um, the other way to do it would be you know, like he gave the example of you, one kid divide, cuts the candy bar in half, but the other kid gets to choose, you know, he said, that's in an ideal world, you'd make rules that before you knew if you were going to be, maybe if you were going to be a man or a woman, or if you were going to be, uh, you know, a white collar person or a person who worked in a factory or whether you were going to be rich or poor. I mean, so I thought that was really a very um, utopian, but kind of an interesting way to look at how to make, do a better job of making laws and rules. Um, and finally, um, I just, well, oh, I was just gonna comment quickly that I thought the footnotes were so hilarious. And, you know, I started reading this on a, in an ebook and the the notes then were all at the end. But oh. then um, when I got back from my trip, I switched over and was reading it in a print book. And then the notes are at the bottom of the page. And so it was so much better because the, the footnotes were so kind of tongue in cheek and witty and, and all of that. And I totally, I thought the way he wrote the book in that sense then was, pretty clever. I mean, he had all these big ideas, but then he had these little asides in the footnotes that I thought made it a very entertaining read. So anyway, those are just some quick thoughts. I had a couple others, but I'll think of them later. So. Well, Donna, please, uh, thank you. And, and yeah, please raise your hand again and, and come back with those thoughts. Um, in speaking to the footnotes in the audio, there's two sounds. There's like a bing, and then it, that means there's a footnote. And then there's a bong, and that's like the end of footnote to bring you back. And it was really funny kind of listening to it. It reminded me of like, it was almost like a game show, uh, but it had this really, uh, it was, it's just a really well-produced, I mean, the credits on the audio book, it's funny. It's it's like such a production you hear of like the, the long list of people. And I don't know if, what it was like in the uh, in the print book, but the acknowledge, acknowledgement section, he talks about how he's like nobody reads this except for the people that think they're going to be in it so i'm going to put some fun facts in here so you might want to listen to them anyway and and i'm listening to it and there's some really like oh that's that's interesting that's cool and there was one that was like what and i thought about it and he goes oh my god he goes i can't believe you believe that if you believe that about the birthday parties that moose hold birthday parties for each other he's like then he's like 
you, you're so gullible. He's like, you fell for that. And I was like, I'm trying to explain myself. I'm like, well, I'm like, I didn't think it was birthday parties, but I was like, I was like, I, I like the idea that they gave each other presents. I go, I thought like, maybe there's something like where they present presents to each other, but not on their birthday. And he just called it birthday parties. I'm sitting here like, I didn't need to explain this to my wife, but I was like, I'm like, I believe that at first, <laughs> but I didn't like focus on the birthday party part of it. I just thought like, oh, that's cool. Animals give each other presents. Like, and I believe that part of it. But then I was like, oh, he's calling me out. Like, I was like, oh, that's funny. Or that's, that's interesting. That's cool. Anyway. Yeah. The, even the acknowledgements are worth, are worth reading or listening to at least, but uh, yeah, bing bong. All right. My favorite white male, Kevin Matson. Kevin, I gotta ask, um, you know, I just, I remember last time, um, you were late, you were looking for the link and I proactively just sent you the link tonight a few minutes before. And I was like, just in case. And I was like, that was, might've been presumptive because I didn't even know if you were coming, but I was yeah. like, you got it. And then you were like, thanks. Did that make you come tonight? I mean, no, that's okay. I was going to, I was, <laughs> so why you're here. <laughs> so no, I'm here to say hi to all you guys. Like, um, and it's, it's, I did not read the book. So first of all, I haven't read the book. Um, I have the book on my to read list, but, um, but I knew I was able to make this. I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna log on. And if these guys just rip the book, then I am gonna pass on it. Um, oh, but I don't hear a lot of ripping. I hear a lot of uh, a lot of people that like the book. It was interesting. Um, coincidentally, I so I didn't know much about it. I, I almost never look at, um, for sure, Jeff, the books that you pick. Um, I never read anything about them. Okay. I don't look, I just, I just, I either, either buy them if I see them, if I'm at a bookstore or um, I check them out from the library and I just put them on my list. And I, so I don't even know, like, I never even know if they're going to be like a mystery or if they're going to be sci-fi, like Paper Girls. I didn't know that Paper Girls was, uh, you know, a, was graphic, a novel? graphic novel. Wow. So, um, so I didn't really know what this was going to be about, but um, coincidentally, I did actually major in philosophy. Um, well, went to the University of Minnesota, and so I am very awesome. happy to hear that this is a philosophy and a moral ethics book. Um, I think those are fantastic puzzles in life. I just think that they are, um, and to be able to think, to have the luxury of being able to to examine morality, to examine ethics, um, I that has added a lot of value to my life over years, and I am very, very excited to read this book, especially with you guys having. Um, basically sounds like mostly people liked it i mean most of what i hear is, is it was pretty good um i don't know i don't watch tv at all i have no familiarity with any of these shows that he's done so i don't have any kind of context for any of that um but uh i would assume this stuff is still going to be kind of funny anyway or entertaining the anecdotes will be entertaining even if i don't know the characters i don't know any of the the stuff related to that um so, but really, I just came, Jeff, to say hi. I mean, really, that's all. Thank I you. really, I'm just, I didn't read the book. I'm like, I'll just listen if there's anything I can say. Awesome. Well, Kevin, knowing knowing that you you are a philosophy major at the U, yes, you should absolutely read this. Um, and you don't have to know any of the characters of any of his shows. Um, it just happens to be uh, the audiobook is read by the actors who played these parts. And he, he does an interesting job. I think a fun job of assigning casting who reads what part. Uh, in the book, uh, you will completely enjoy the book. I mean, we um, we could devote some time right now, but I mean, like I I thoroughly enjoyed it. I I don't, you know, it's it's something that you know I I've taken some classes in it as part of what I had to do, but I didn't major in it, uh, and so some stuff was familiar, but you know, and I have a religious background, so it's like some of it was common sense, or some of it's like yeah, like this is the way you should be kind of thing. But he just he he gives his reasons why he's fascinated by these topics why he wants to go into it and then really really gets into it i mean and i think i mean might be oversimplifying it but honestly it, it's like it's like a pop culture it, it's probably for you being a major of it it's probably going to be familiar and maybe light and not as deep on the topic but i think for a majority of people this really explains things in a way that that makes it digestible and worth talking about and sharing and thinking about and he talks about you know the books that he read in in these philosophers and maybe um how to distill that in a way that um more people can get something from it because 
we're not all going to tackle, you know, the original text. Um, so yeah, I got a lot from it personally. I'd love to hear what anyone else did, but I mean, I, I highly recommend it, especially knowing your background. I, I think you'll enjoy it quite a bit. You will have a few laughs and uh, you'll probably be able, I mean, it might give you, you know, some new thoughts on some things too, but you'll probably add a lot to it. I wish you had read it knowing I your know, background was, going into this I, discussion. I was so busy, like the holidays. It's just, I was so busy this month and I have like four other books I'm trying to finish. And I was like, man, I just have to wait on this. Like it. Um, well, what are you and, doing tonight? Cause you can put it on like one and a half or two times speed. You start listening to it right after this discussion. We tomorrow at Urban Growler at seven o'clock or just listen to it all day. You can listen to it in a day. I mean, I don't know what your day is tomorrow, but like when you're at the blackjack table, maybe you can have it like in one year or something. <laughs> so it's funny. I thought about that too. When you said, um, when somehow I was going to, ah, in one of the, one of the points that somebody else had said, I was going to relate being in the casino business, um, to this. Oh, Anne Rand. It was going to be along the Anne Rand, uh, take. And I was like, oh yeah, there are just uh, so many people that I interact with that believe that they, they just did this all by themselves. Like there are these small, like, some of them, you know, there, there are many, many quality and good and ethical um, small business people that recognize um, that recognize the contribution of the whole to their business. Um, but they're all, and to also say, I interact with a lot of them that, that just don't, that they believe they built these businesses all by themselves. And they, and um, it just, I think, I think some of that's a function of, I think some of that's a function of being in the casino business. Um, but I, uh, but I, some the Anran stuff comes up a lot um, in my life. Um, but I really will wrap up. I want to wrap up with two quick things, Jeff, because I saw your post about 19 years. And yes, I'm pretty sure that 19 years ago at Bryant Lake Bowl that I was there, I texted two people this week about books and bars. I'm going to try to get them to log on. Shelly Angamak, who I'm sure oh, yeah. you remember Shelly Angamak. Yeah. She lives in Pennsylvania. And uh, Kristen Fitzpatrick, who lives in Washington D.C. right now, but they were back in those old back yeah. back in the day from from like yeah twenty years ago now. Well, nineteen years ago, it would have been at Bound to Be Red Bookstore, and then and then it would have been at Green Mill. Oh, Green Mill, in the, yep, yep, in the, yep, yeah, in the, in the basement of Green Thanks. Mill in Uptown, which is yep. now Red Cow. Uh, yep. <laughs> but uh, and then and then. Um, when it really kind of, I would say, became what it was, and when I was running it on my own, was was Brian Lake Bull moving forward. But I was, I like yeah, was it, yeah, yeah. But but thank you, yeah. Brian Lake Bull is yeah is is our uh, salad days. If I if I knew what that meant, but I love using it. Um, I never know if salad days is good or bad. Like it's like you had enough money you could afford a salad, or all you could afford was a salad. But I feel like <laughs> salad days means you have enough that you can also get a salad. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but no, uh, but yes, you've been, you've been around for a while and thank you. And you should come back and you should just listen to this book all day tomorrow and then join us at Urban Growler if you can. Uh, and we'll be there in person talking about it. Um, but you know, uh, plan ahead next time, but I'm just glad you came and said hi and glad you came and said hi. Yeah. February is, is our anniversary. It'll be 19 years uh, next month. And we'll talk about that more than I'll make a much bigger deal for the 20th. If I can make it to 20, it'd be great. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, 19, 19, good times. A um, couple more hands up. Uh, couple, what you bring up though is, so if you don't know, uh, Kevin works uh, in, in the casino business. And uh, I brought this idea of luck up because luck is is mentioned in the book and it's and it's similar to what you talk about where people think that they've done this all on their own and they didn't have any help you know the you know they pull themselves up from their bootstraps and you know no i i made this i you just you can do this all on your own it's nothing about um he talked about luck in this book and and um i don't know if luck is always the word that 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 people like or if it relates to it but uh he talks in a way about how yeah it, it's it's not just you that did this it, there's so many other factors that played into you know he talks about michael jordan if he's born a different time in this world you know he's he's probably not michael jordan you know what i mean if he if michael jordan is born six inches shorter you know what i mean these, these kind of all these things that, that that come into play um that have to line up for somebody to you know, have the success or failure that they have. And, uh, and, and luck is one of these things that's, that's mentioned in here. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Any, anyone have thoughts on that? But I see Donna and Pete are back. So Donna, let's go to you. 
Oh, just one more quick thing. When Kevin was talking about that whole individualism thing, and I was going to mention that I think that ties in with another interesting section in the book. I know in the interview or the presentation he gave online, um, he talked about the most difficult chapter to write in the book was the one we talked about quite a bit earlier about how you can still choose to like some things that are yeah. like created by people that are are flawed and so on. But he another point he made though was that um because somebody asked the question how did the pandemic change you know what you think how you think about things and he said my gosh I could have written so much more about the pandemic than I did but he was so struck by how the COVID created a situation where everybody was dealing with something that was a challenge and was difficult and required some decision making. And I really personally appreciated and had some kind of new insights into um, the his discussion about the choice to wear masks or not, or the whole issue about mask yeah. wearing, how he tied it in with that idea about you know, if there's some small thing you can do that to the that can potentially benefit so many people, why wouldn't you do it? You know, and, say, and how somehow in America, again, you talked about in America, we're so hung up on this liberty, you know, kind of thing. And don't make me do anything I personally don't want to do. So he 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 mentioned how it was such a surprise to him too what the blowback was from people that just didn't want to wear a mask and by golly they were almost militant about don't you can't you know would get angry if they were asked to put on a mask and so on and it it just didn't for, for all the reading he had done on all these philosophers and all of the how you can choose to be helpful to other people and to play a role in making the world a better place and all in choosing to be a good person that it just just the mask thing was just mind blowing to him that he just couldn't couldn't uh, see how that could be an issue for people. So I thought that he did it. I think that was another example of how he could come up with specific instances that illustrated the larger points. Now, maybe it's good he didn't go too much more into the pandemic because maybe then, like somebody said earlier, it might date the book and it's, you know, at a point, at a certain point in time. But for now, it really, I thought, resonated with a lot of what we went through. I think the same thing with guns and so on too, but that's another issue I know. But I think, my gosh, if you just think to regulate guns more, for the benefit of potential benefit of all these other people, even if you still can do your gun, but let's put some restrictions on it for the benefit of society. Well, okay, in America, we don't we don't do that, I guess. Uh, I think it's it's good to read things that are addressing us uh, our current or very current, you know past situation. Um, you know, when we read the sentence by Louise Erdrich that that dealt a lot with um, COVID and the pandemic. And I felt like it was amazing that she wrote that and got that out as quickly as I felt like, you know, we're still in it. I mean, you know, we are still in it in a way. And but we can also look back and remember what it was like two years ago versus the way it is now. Um, I just think uh, if you think too much in terms of I don't want to write something that is going to make me dated or um, won't be relevant later, you know, you might not be, a, you know, living in the moment in the now anyway, because I mean, how many books ultimately are ever considered you know, classics or or are looked back on many years later. The funny thing is, I actually think this one could be in a way, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if some some colleges pick this up and be like, you know, philosophy, you know, that you can actually understand, you know what I mean? Or let, let's use this book um, as an intro to philosophy or something like that. I, I would not be surprised at all. Um, so I think, yes, it, it, you can maybe date it in, in some ways, but I think it's good. And it, and it's really fun for us to actually be like, this is someone who's, who's in what we're in right now and dealing with, you know, the things that we're dealing with. 
And uh, whether that is like, you know, political humor of SNL, uh, but you know, you want that you want, that's why sometimes like you need the, um, something happens in the news, but it really helps for you to um, see like what the late night talk show hosts are saying about it. Or at least um, for me personally, you know, I like it when it's distilled through, you know, I, it's something tragic happens, but I can also have, you know, it distilled through the comedic voices that, that helped me put it in perspective and maybe things aren't going to be that bad forever, but you know, we can, we can also laugh at it. So I don't know, man, Kevin, you got to read this book. It's great. <laughs> All right, Pete, talk to us. Hey, I got a prop. Oh. So this is oh. the first American printing. Can you bring uh, it back a little? Yeah, yeah. Don't put it too close. A little farther back and then, yeah, hold it go. there. There you go. The myth yep. of Sisyphus and other essays. Yeah so, this, yeah. so my brother gave me this for Christmas in... Um, 1988, when I was <clears throat> really uh, in my deep in my existentialism, <clears throat> and especially the uh, Camus version, where I still have The Plague is one of my favorite books, and I was blown away they were quoting that. Like that's like the first quote going into the book right at the beginning, and uh, it's a you know the 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 uh, short version of that is that. Um, a priest and an atheist team up to save as many lives as they can in a in a plague ridden town that has been sealed off and no one's helping them unless they help themselves and it's it's just a beautiful story and um uh and uh but it's just kind of like uh like the philosophy part of this book is deep i was surprised that he went to the greatest hits like that and then um and this, this, I've also read Being in Nothingness, which is like, that was like, that's, that's like 15, 20 hours of my life I'll never get back. I don't even know what I read. And, was, and then a friend of mine, <clears throat> as when I was reading it, and he said, look at this book. And then he opens, he said, just let's open up to a random page. And he does. And he read one paragraph. And he said, could you even understand what that just was? He said, <laughs> it is so heady and so uh uh deep but does it actually say much but um but i like the uh the i like how uh shore brings it all together in this book to like it is simple things like uh i've done this but i make it more of a practice now as the I, whenever i see garbage in the neighborhood i pick it up and try to get it in its place um and uh, you know, just try to do little things to make things better. Try not to get frustrated with in lines and all that stuff. Try to help other people, help people with their groceries and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, you know, I think it's it's as if if you try, it, it doesn't it doesn't take that much to us try to be a little better. And then just like and forgive ourselves when when we're we're not great. So. Uh, you know, because we're just, like I said earlier in the chat, we're just meat. So <laughs> we're just meat, but that doesn't mean we can't be, you know, tasty. Good meat. Tasty meat. Good meat. <laughs> Good meat. <laughs> Make that meat work for you. Well, Pete, I like that you're trying that, you know, obviously you're, you know, you're out there, you're out there doing the work. You know, I, I, I don't doubt, I don't doubt anyone in this group uh, being, um, you know, I saw that Donna was nominated for the good place. I mean, I, I think you're all going, but <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, you're you're yeah, all they, good people to me. Yeah, because I think that's the that's the uh, what Stephen P Pinker theorizes is why why the vast decline in global human on human violence because it's um, he posits that it's storytelling, storytelling getting more prolific and and that's raising a level of empathy for people that are getting outside of their own in-group. Uh, I don't, I, you know, let the, let the world keep chewing on that one, but I think it's part of it. I mean, I've, I've, I don't, I don't, I don't think you find a whole lot of like mass killers that are widely read, right? <laughs> 
or and one of the of great you right because one of the great things about reading is 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 putting yourself in you know another person's perspective another person's shoes you know this idea of um you can have empathy um when you hear someone else's story or when you when you see that we're more alike than we are different uh across all these cultures and so it's uh yeah i mean <laughs> You do hear the serial killer who, I mean, yeah, who maybe has a tattered copy of Catcher in the Rye in his back pocket <laughs> and, and letters to Jody Foster before he tries to shoot Ronald Reagan. I mean, but um, I don't yeah, know how really well put Reagan yourself was. out there. <laughs> read a, <laughs> read a out middle there. school book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rebecca, talk to us. Um, I had two comments. One about the mask wearing, because I do think that if there was ever an example of <clears throat> that really affected the world, um, that was a choice that really kind of for me defined the two types. I, I know I'm uh, oversimplifying, but the two types of humans that we have, and perhaps the two types of cultures that are present around the globe. And the reason why I think of that is Eastern cultures, Japan and Korea, um, at least South Korea, adopted the mask way earlier for other reasons. They had bird flu, they had other pandemics. Well, they, I'm not sure that they were called pandemics because, but they had, uh, you know, illnesses that swept their country. And so they adopted. And I'm going to be careful about what I say, but I think they're, as a society, they're more interested in following rules than not. Whereas I think there's a certain amount of people in the United States who consider not following the rules to be the best way to be. Uh, and so when anyone gives them a rule, they will try to not follow it and then consider themselves the better human for it. And I think mask wearing became an example of that. Um, and also because people are really, really stupid and um, selfish. Um, and it, it, the two types of humans that I'm talking about, and this is something else that I've, I don't know, it, it has to do with religion. I had that religious upbringing and all that, but um, I, I very generally think that there are people who think that their only job is to take care of themselves. And if they do a good job of doing that, then they've done their part. And it, if everybody took care of themselves, then we wouldn't have any issues. We wouldn't have war. We wouldn't have poverty. We wouldn't have disease, at least rampant disease. It's all, we're all supposed to just take care of ourselves and, and asking anything else is doing it the wrong way. And of course, then there are others who think that their first job is to help others, perhaps even at their own cost. Say the, the priest and the atheist who are taking care of those um, communities in the plague, you know, that they are putting themselves at risk for um, others. And of course, religion, uh, at least the flavor that I'm most used to, um, is all about helping others before you take care of yourself. And that's the way to do it. Now, I've had a lot of conversations with libertarians because libertarians often are of the first type. They believe that their only responsibility is to do the best that they can for themselves. And that's the only way to come up with a righteous society that you know will do it. And you cannot argue with some of their 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 positions. It, it they they have a point. Of course, it doesn't um at all address that the fact that we don't start with the same things and that we can't all succeed in the same way. We can't all take care of ourselves to the same extent. So, um, but that would be their preferred position to, to say that if everyone had the same things, that all we have to do is take care of ourselves. Um, and I see that more and more. I think it's very attractive in a distracting, confusing um world that has, seems to have more chaos than not. And so their, their, their search for happiness or their search for flourishing begins at home. And that that's all they can do to take care of. And, and it is super threatening to them to be asked to do, to do more and including wearing a mask. And so I, I, I'm not gonna say that these people 
shouldn't, um, well, I'm going to use burn in hell, but <laughs> whatever we call that. But I almost understand how they're trying to make sense of the world based on their mm, closest hold held tenants. They, they, they don't like charity. They don't like um, uh, anything being asked of them to give to others. And it is, it, I think they will be judged very harshly when, if, and if there is such a time that we all get judged, but I can understand that because we all make concessions to ourselves at certain points. Oh, I'm going to keep this five dollars for myself rather than giving it. You know. Anyway, that's those are my two comments. That uh, um, and I think if there is an architect of humanity or whatever, you know, I, I'm not. I don't really necessarily believe that there is a an intelligence trying to make sense of it. I don't think. But perhaps that this all of this is the point. This is how we um, are expected to to spend our time on Earth is figuring out what to do. And so having discussions like this from an author who really took the time to do it, we're doing good work right now. We're doing what we should be doing. So anyway, thanks, Rebecca. One of the things that he he brings up is um, this idea. Uh, if if there isn't anything though, some people feel like, well, then what's the point of why should you why should you do any of this? And I think that's that's one of maybe the reasons why he doesn't address um, you know religious beliefs or belief in a higher power as much in the book, partially because he wants us to to look at this and say, I'm not going to get into that with you all, whether you believe that or not. Um, because if you don't, and that's fine, these are still kind of the things that I love that he talked about what we owe each other. Um, that that's something that he was really dealt with a lot in in the good place, and he talks about it in this in this book too. Is this idea of well, at the very least, you know, what do we what do we owe the other people around us? Because I think one of the points of the of you know whichever um, philosophy you adhere to from this is you're not here alone. Um, you know, no one is an island. You do have to work to, you know, we have to work together. We, we, we're here together. And, uh, you know, so what are you going to be, you know, what are you going to be to somebody else? Um, you know, and you, and you have to be, you know, something better and productive. Um, if, if you have the opportunity to, you, you can't just, um, kind of sit back and assume, well, someone else will will do that. Like you, you owe it to kind of rise to, you know, the best that you can be and 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 to flourish in that sense too. So, Mark, you've been waiting for a while. We're still here for you, Mark. Talk to us. Uh, yeah. So, um, I, uh, just one little quick note. I, I did think it was interesting that he did reference my name is Earl as the lead in for. Um, the office, which kind of yeah. gave them momentum, because that is a that's a show that dealt strictly with being a good person and struggling with being on both sides of whether you're going to do the right thing or not do the right thing. Yeah. So how much of that was in his, you know, back of his mind, knowing that he's likely a fan of that show. Um, and, you know, I really like the book, this book for all. And I, I've gotten a little bit of tastes of philosophy here and there, but I appreciate the the commitment that philosophers have to world building, as long as I get fatigued when it's too complicated, and then you run into all the anomalous situations that challenge it. I just want, I want a book like this one that I'm holding here. That it's a, uh, it's blurred out because I blurred my, course, <laughs> I blurred myself. It's called Some Forty Tales of the Afterlife. They're very very short pieces on what this one surgeon felt like heaven could be just 40 different interpretations of heaven. It's very short. It's a quick read. I want something like that for utopian ideation that doesn't get into the complication of it's all going to hell because this got ruined or it's all going to hell because these people needed to fight on this side of things. I just want the uplifting story of 40 different utopias. And I'd like to place myself in one of them as an imaginative experiment as opposed to feeling like there's death and gloom and destruction on the back end of 
someone spoiling it somewhere. In the, and I know everybody's utopia is different. That's why there would need to be multiples of them for me to think about. But too many utopian, too much utopian fiction ends up being dystopian fiction. And I just get wiped out by it. Can you give us uh, any examples of uh, the 40? Any like oh, what, what, one of them's one... called the act one of them's called the actor, and you get up on stage at the end, and everyone in the um everyone who is part of your world is the cast. Stuff like that. Um, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. That'd be um, great. Yeah, and so it came and went, but Time Magazine made it a strong recommendation. And like I say, it's a really quick read. They got titles like Microbe, Missing, Metamorphosis. They're not all M's. What uh, what's it? What's the author's name? David Eagleman. Cool. And they may not they may not all be uplifting as I'm now thinking about it as I'm reading the back cover, but most of them seem to fall on the side of providing you with some pleasant likelihood instead of something grim. So. That's great, Mark. Thanks for sharing. Appreciate that. That sounds cool. I'll check that one out. And so with The Good Place and others, like The Good Place was great world building that didn't, even if it got complicated, they had fun with it. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't like the ones where you're not going to see an upside. And so that's why The Good Place kind of held its own for me because it was more on balance good than bad in terms of where people ended up. And you still didn't know exactly where it was going to end up. Um, so yeah, that's, that was a favorite of ours. <clears throat> and Go Ghosts is another one that's, that's on right now that's helpful too, in terms of being a good person and trying to figure out where you might've gone wrong or, you know, why you're, why you're still a ghost on earth, um, and how you can be a better person, even when you're not in the physical space that other people might be in. So, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I've, I've actually have I've heard decent things about that show. Is that the Are you watching the uh, American version, or was there a BB like a British version? Yeah, we started with the U.S. version, so we're not familiar with the British one, but we've heard the British one is as good, if not better, than the American version. That's what they always say. Yeah, <laughs> it's usually because it's shorter, right? It's just six episodes instead of right. That's why it became it became unfair to compare the uh, the original Office to the American Office because there's just so many more uh, uh, you know uh, seasons of the American one than the British Office. But I started there. Rebecca, talk to us. Um, when you were talking about utopias, I. Um, I cannot remember who wrote it, but it was something I read early on in my sci-fi fantasy. Um, that I would say that's my main genre. And because I think all sci-fi really pretty much ends up being philosophy, you know, what does it mean to be human? Um, we contrast ourselves with the other to, to uh, show, uh, develop, uh, uh, understand what we are. Um, so this particular book, and if, if I describe it well enough, maybe some of you can, can help me figure out who it was, but um, um, the world had become perfect. There was no strife. There was no uh, lack of resources. Um, everybody was healthy. Everybody was, you know, they had figured out all the things and come to this perfect place. And they slowly all died. And the the and I can't remember what mechanism they used whether it was other aliens com uh, commenting on this society and and why they didn't uh, survive but basically that um, to strive to overcome to deal with problems and issues is the stuff of life and if we don't have that if everything is perfection if we are granted heaven while we are still in human form, we get bored or get, um, mm -hmm. uh, we, we have nothing, nothing. And I realize I'm, I'm recently retired a year and a half. Um, and I have tried very hard to make my life as perfect as possible. I've reduced the amount of things that I'm required to do. I've um, upped the amount of things I want to do. I, and I am, but I'm very conscious that I can um, overdo the selfishness and the 
only paying attention to my needs at the cost of living a full life. And that full life means dealing with things that I don't have the answers for or don't have the resources for or don't know exactly. It may be hard. It might be painful. It might you know, require me leaving my house, which is just horrible. But if I don't have those things or something like that to give me a contrast, then I can't enjoy the pleasures that I have in my home or in my life. I, I need, we need to have strife. We need to have loss. We need to have that pain that I talked about earlier, that hardness, that unfairness. Otherwise, we stop being human, I think. It takes two to make a thing go right. Sunshine and rain, joy and pain. Exactly. Yes, you need the, the, the yin and the yang. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you don't, uh, right. You don't appreciate uh, the highs um, without having, you know, come out of the lows. Uh, you, yeah, that's mm -hmm. good. So you, you don't remember what the name of this was and, and you're hoping that it, one of us would know it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, 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 that's a suggestion in the chat, Lynn. I'll look that up. Um, okay. But I, I don't know. I was reading pretty well-known sci-fi authors back in that time. I think it was in my twenties. Um, and it could have been a short story. Um, and there were, a, there are, there are, you know, probably a lot of people who've uh, addressed this issue, but it, for me, it was just so crystallized. I was like, look, they've solved all the things and then realized, oh, and uh, your phrase actually, when it says utopian fiction often ends up being dystopian. That was an example of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a good episode of the twilight zone. Um, yeah, it's or Black Mirror. It, it, yeah, when you have it all, you you know you have nothing. Basically, it's uh, you need to have that balance. Um, yeah, that's the premise of the one who thinks he's in heaven because everything's going right, but it turns out it's in hell. So yeah, I, I get that. I, I guess it's more on the macro level of uh, why can't there be more good for everybody all around the world? Because the, what you're speaking to, Rebecca, there's some people who don't get a break in terms of it being strife all the time. So yeah. uh, I'm looking at a redistribution and I know American society is what it is. And there's a lot of that philosophy around the world. It's either the individual or the collective and one of them is gonna get villainized in service of uh, the, the side that wants to win. Uh, and so, you know, when, when a billionaire buys Twitter and they could have done what, you know, it was, it was all in the, the section he had about the guy that, wants everyone to give up more of their money. Um, now I did look him up. It, it does seem like they give away 40%. There's, there's, there's various figures for how much that Mr. Singer gives away. Um, but he's making a lot of bank on all of the books that he's putting out with the philosophies in it to begin with. So, um, you know, where, where to draw the line when it comes to how much you sacrifice in service of the greater good. Well, it's, it's like, um, one of the things that sure talks about is, uh, you know, how difficult it was for him just to change his bank account. But ultimately, you know, he, he said he, he was too much work. He wasn't going to do it, but then he did. And he said, I will tell you, it was as much work as I thought it was, but I just could, you know, he couldn't justify not doing it at a certain point. And he, it, you know, it, it, it when it's all said and done, what was it? You know, it was a couple months of back and forth, but moving forward, you know, he's, he's done that now and, and it's going to be for the better. Um, I did, there's things like that where you do have to inconvenience yourself. It seems like, you, you know, um, to, to make these, these changes, these things, um, to make the right choice. And ultimately I think what he's saying is, Put in, put in a little bit of work, put in a little bit of hardship now, deal with it. Um, in the long run, it's it's going to be better and you will, you know, you'll benefit others from that too. Kevin, do you still have your hand up? Yes, Kevin. He's yeah, in this up. time, he has read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had, I had He's going to be there times. tomorrow. And the audio book on 10 times speed or 50 times speed. in one ear, you and the other go. That's right. No. So a couple, a couple things like, um, for sure. I mean, the more the conversation drifts a little bit away from the actual contents of the book, 
in into like philosophy or ideas about life or morals and ethics. I mean, the more I, the more engaged I can be in that <laughs> because like I haven't read the book, but um, but a couple of things like Pete, I think Pete mentioned um, Steven Pinker and that the world like um, some of the some of the arguments that he sort of makes that the world yeah people actually are kinder people actually are better like the world actually is um, less violent than it was um, you know 200 500 however many years ago and I, I like thinking about those things and I think to the idea of utopia so playing around with that idea that was one thing that came up um, whoever mentioned Stephen Pinker but um, and uh, the other one is uh, the ideas of utopia of course as people you know, these small groups, almost cult-like groups, a lot of times have tried to form these utopian societies, you know, and they do fall apart because life is in motion. And I, I don't know exactly, having not read the book, I don't know exactly how much that's in the book, but um, life being in motion and the fact that we, even if you achieve a state of say something like nirvana or some sort of perfection in a moment, um, because time moves, there's no way to maintain that. And without kind of the yin and the yang, the, the positives, the negatives, like Jeff, you kind of said, you touched on that in a response, I think to probably to Rebecca, that, um, you know, that without the good, we don't, or without the bad, we don't appreciate the good. Without the, without the positives, we don't appreciate the negatives. And, or either, you know, however, all those different things fit together in life. And, um, and I think there's a lot of value in that. And I don't know exactly how that fits into the book, but um, I think that those are, true life experiences that we can appreciate and we can value and we can um, live for without actually striving for specifically utopia or specifically perfection. Um, and we can do good in the world to touch on Stephen Pinker. So I don't know, those kinds of things, those ideas. I mean, I love these ideas and I love the discussion. I love hearing this. I just love hearing the, the, the thoughts about that. Um, this is, it's valuable in a way that doesn't come up very often in everyday life. You know, people's everyday lives, they don't just sit around talking about ethics and morality, you know, <laughs> so that's, so it's good. So that's all, that's, that's all I have to say. So, but, well, yeah. thanks, Kevin. Yeah, no, I mean, you guys are all, I mean, this, I mean, I, I wouldn't have wanted to talk about this with anyone else. So I'm so glad that I, I have this discussion and then tomorrow uh, to talk about this because yeah, this is stuff that I, I'm really interested in and I feel like, it, it just seemed like a perfect kind of New Year's read to me. You know, there's so much talk of resolutions and what we're going to do differently. And, you know, you want to improve yourself. Uh, this is, you know, a fun starting point. Um, and I think it's achievable stuff. It's not like he's, you know, advocating, you know, give away everything you own and, you know, and just, you know, follow someone in the desert or something like that. I mean, he's, he's talking very realistically about, you know, a situation that a lot of us are in. And I think he addresses, you know, certain people have more than others, but, you know, again, what do we owe each other and what can we, you know, what can we do to make things better here for not just us, but for everyone around us, which will then, you know, lift up everyone else. I see Pete's back with his hand. Pete, talk to us. Oh, just real quick. Thanks, um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, Mark, I'll check out your book. That sounds, uh, was really moving to you. So I'd like to uh, see what that's all about. But the, um, uh, yeah, my uh, my religious upbringing is not very helpful. I'm Unitarian Universalist, so <laughs> uh, we don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> With the, and then, with the universalist sounds like you would do a lot though well everyone's going to heaven in our in our theology so uh, we don't we don't we don't have a bad place so um but the um uh but yeah the but it doesn't mean we can't make the world nicer here and and that's the thing too as i tell like i have a team that people work for me and i was say like you know like let's just make this the best place any of us have ever worked and we'll just give that to each other and it doesn't mean we goof off all the time or whatever it is it means we get stuff done you feel good about what you did and um no one has to have anxiety on sunday night or whatever it is uh, or ever worried about what work pressure is like we just come in and you do your thing 
And if you don't know, then help each other. Like, I mean, I'll do what I can, but um, but just watch out for each other. And it, it it does work, you know. People respond. They um, they you know. So I think there is probably something quantifiable in what we owe each other. I think you can, you know. I know I've benefited immensely by the kindness of everyone here and uh, all those that aren't present, all those books and bars stuff. Uh, 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 people, um, I think there's there's a lot more um, good in the world. Not that it's um, not to ignore the 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 shitty stuff, and I'll make fun of it when they show up in front of me. But uh, I think we can. I I I I, th I think I think this world can be good and better. We just keep trying with each other. That's it. I'm out. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. That's it. I mean, that would be a great thing to end on, unless anyone else has anything else they want to say about uh, tonight's book. Thank you guys so much for sharing your perspectives and your time. Um, I really appreciate you all being here. Um, again, if you're in town and available, we are meeting uh, tomorrow at uh, Urban Growler uh, in St. Paul in the barrel room and we'll have another discussion of this book they're always different um but you're always uh welcome to attend either or both uh next time is oh i wanted to share you guys the